cards are like living, breathing human beings. I suppose because um, they give you real pleasure. You sit in a room with them for 10 or 15 hours a day, and they become your friends, uh, particularly very lonely people. If I could go back in history, and I can, <laughs> the performer I would most like to see would be Johann Nepomuk Hofsenser, the famous Viennese card magician who called playing cards the poetry of magic. My favorite of his many experiments from the 19th century, an experiment called Everywhere and Nowhere. The question was to speak about the state of current magic in America. Uh, I know absolutely nothing about the 20th century. And I'm not just talking about magic. Fade. Jubio. Solarity. The seven of diamonds from the six to the seven of diamonds and the gentleman on the end. Ten of spades. The ten of spades. Oh, wow. <laughs> There are probably more books written about magic than any other art form. Literally thousands and thousands of books, and I've collected thousands of books in my life about magic technique. But I believe that the real key to learning is personally. It's almost like the sensei master relationship in the martial arts. That the way you want to learn is by someone that you respect showing you something. There's a level of, uh, of of transmission and a level of appreciation that's uh, never completely attainable just through the written word. I've been really, really lucky to be around people and to feel very much part of this ongoing continuum of sleight of hand that can be traced back many, many uh, years, more than a century. Ladies and gentlemen, beginners, please. Everybody, the beginners, thank you. Yeah. What are we doing next? I'll see you on the other side. All right. <laughs> A man named Canada Bill Jones, by all accounts, was the greatest Monty hustler who ever lived. Canada Bill was, of course, from England. In his day, the game was played uh, with three identical cards, in this case, the uh, Queen of Hearts. And they would take out a uh, marking crayon and put a big X on one of the queens, and you had to find the marked card, the queen with the X. Then a little later, they thought it was better to play with black cards. So instead, they played with three black cards, and they took out a pencil, a red pencil, and made a big circle so you could see it. And then they thought, well, you know, if you want to... Them. All you have to do is play with a black one and a pair of queens, and you don't need a pencil. Now they play with one queen and two black cards, so we're not going to We'll continue. I remember going to a show of Ricky Jane and his 52 assistants, and uh, he said, uh, boy, there were like three or four really big card sheets in the audience tonight. I said, wow. 
it's the guys you know. I said, yeah, yeah. Big, you know, card hustlers. And and, and I said, so the, these guys going to come backstage? Said, Probably not. And they didn't. You know, but he does inhabit a world that you imagine that he would inhabit. He knows characters. I was around magic all the time. It's my earliest memory. It's my earliest family memory. It's my earliest social memory. It's my earliest artistic memory. You know, so, you know, it just was part of my being. New York Sunday News, New Jersey, March 14th, 1956. Two of a kind. Max Katz, past president of the Society of American Magicians, is about to be tricked by his seven-year-old grandson, Ricky Potash of Elizabeth, magician in his own right. Ricky hasn't given much thought to what he wants to be when he grows up, but one thing he doesn't want to be is a professional magician, which he is now at the age of seven. He made his first public appearance at the age of four at the New York Magician's Picnic. I remember doing this dreadful effect when I was three or four years old, producing cups from Lundy's, the seafood restaurant in Sheepshead Bay, which was terrible, and or, uh, producing uh, rubber fruit from a pan, which was awful, uh, you know, pretending to uh, lick a rubber ice cream cone, which I had just produced from the pan, which was awful. So within a year of that time, I think I was actually doing shows where I dressed up in a full tail suit and did more bad magical effects. Here I have an empty canister. You're all on it, because strange things are going to happen. Sir, will you please look at my magic bunny? Well, the bunny jumps out with this big a little Peruvian guinea pig. Oh. I'll put it right in. I want to see this. This is really oh. something. May I put it in for you, Ricky? No. Then may it out. Rock-a-bye, Bonnie. La, la, la. Well, my bunny has set more men up. Time to wake him up. I was a very comfortable performer from the beginning, and my guess is it's because I started at such a, such a young age. My grandfather, uh, Max Katz, was an amateur magician on a pretty serious level. He came over from Austria-Hungary as a small boy. He lived in Brooklyn, as did we. He had a, a Wall Street firm. He was a CPA through an act of Congress. He never went to college. And my grandfather actually took formal lessons from a bunch of magicians who were sensational. And then these people became his friends. And then became my early mentors. Slidini, Francis Carlyle, Di Vernon, Al Flasso, these people I got to see who were sensational. So, I mean, this was part of the great gift from my grandfather. remember as a five or six year old, my grandfather would bring me over to Cardini's house, which was truly amazing because Cardini was known not to associate with very many magicians, you know, and he was just an extraordinary act. I only went to Cardini's twice. I was largely schmoozing with my grandfather, but kind enough to show me something. I mean, I still remember vividly him showing me a reverse fan that he made, you know, in this enormous circle. Uh, of space, you know, the way he made this fan in his hand. Cardini was probably the greatest act I ever saw in my life. <laughs> As a treat, my grandfather brought me to a magic convention in Chicago when I was very young. Cardini did the act. I think it was the last time he ever did his act. It 
just was this extraordinary combination of elements blending together, the characterizations of him as the tipsy Englishman, and the idea that these miracles just sort of happened to him. He didn't produce cards, cards appeared in his hand. He was desperate to get them out of his hand, and the second they got out of his hand, there were more cards in his hand. It just really transcended anyone else doing similar effects. It's also something from an era that no longer exists. The end of vaudeville, in which you could make a living doing an act for a few minutes. You would just go from town to town, from you know house to house, and do your act. And it just was wonderful. It was breathtaking. There's a thing about holding cards in one's hand that, that's amazing. It becomes like a meditative tool, just sitting there and shuffling cards for hours and thinking about them. It's almost infinite what one can do with them. grandfather would have very specific commentaries on the performance of various magicians. For example, watching Slidini, he would say, look how wonderfully he misdirects attention. Watch his incredible ability to direct the attention of a spectator specifically where he wants to direct it. I'm going to take the ball, I'm going to put it inside of the hand, just wait, and I close the hand. Squeeze. When I open the hand, you see the ball completely disappear. Come in, I'll close, watch, really see. Come in, watch. Now to really slow, okay? All right? Watch it. Really slow. Okay. And to say, nothing here, nothing here. Is it in your pocket? No. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Oh. You can see, right? You know why? I did too fast. So this time I do slow. Really slow. Yeah. <laughs> like a now I'll tell you why you didn't see. I'll explain to you, see? Before I put the ball this way, you couldn't see the ball, right? right. Why? You're hiding it. You're clever. <laughs> You're clever. I hide it with the hand, right? But this time I'm not going to put it this way. I'm going to put it this way. Come here, watch. Really slow. No more. <laughs> I worked very closely with him many years. I directed two shows, 52 Assistants and Ricky Janice, and I directed him, I think, seven or eight movies. Trip bases. Beat him, my friend. Club Flush. You owe me six thousand dollars. Thank you very much. Next case. I would always tell you know, show me something. So years ago, we said, okay, I'll show you the beginning effect. Off you go. Where you can come back and do this effect better than anyone's ever done it. I'll show you another. 
this was worked out after a while and got bored and it wasn't my thing and I did again. I mean, I respect the fact that the essence of his profession is secrecy and unobtainability. We all want to know how the trick is done. The technical skills to master them take a lifetime. To tell them to the uninitiated would be a desecration, so I stopped asking. <laughs> My grandfather would say, when you watch Francis Carlyle, it's not only technique and presentation, but listen to the way that he explains an effect with such clarity that people go away knowing exactly what's happened. It was a wonderful piece of advice, because people are often confused in terms of what was even supposed to take place in a magic illusion. Francis was great about letting you know what was supposed to happen and what did happen and why you should be excited about it. Francis was uh, a serious alcoholic and he had stopped drinking for years and uh, he went out to the Magic Castle in Los Angeles and uh, had a number of very good years out there and then eventually started drinking again. And I found him on the streets of L.A. shortly before he died, brought him home to stay with me for a few days in my apartment in Venice. And not long after that, he was found uh, on the streets. <laughs> I would go uh, and visit Al Faso. I would go to his shop um, on 34th Street, uh, you know, fairly often and watch him. He'd walk up this long, narrow staircase and open up the door. Al would be behind the counter. Right? He was a very small man. I mean, he was barely past five feet tall with these giant, thick glasses and this great grand, usually wearing shirt sleeves and suspenders and uh, just surrounded by this clutter. He got me interested in the history of the art as well. The first posters I ever bought were from Flosso. And he really did create one of the great personas of anybody performing magic, a Coney Island faker. He was just a great character coming from the Barker tradition. And he worked on the Sells Floto Circus. I think he worked at Algie Barnes. He really was a sideshow carnival magician out of Coney Island. So now from the circus lots, Professor Al Flasso. I remember him making Ed Sullivan truly laugh, which was uh, almost unheard of. Now coming up here, I'll show him how this is done. All you have to do is reach up in the air and get all you want. Grab one in a can. That's good. Put the other hand in a can. That's better. Blow it in before you lose it. Put your hand out. Look at this. Grab one. Pull it in your pocket. Keep that for coming up here. I don't get the money. Did you get it? Let's see. <laughs> That's what I thought. Throw that game with both hands. You literally cannot think about Al Flosso without smiling. And I suppose uh, the only kind memory I ever had of my parents is that uh, when it was time for my bar mitzvah, they asked me what I would like at the party, and I said I wanted Al Flosso to perform. And, it was a pretty ballsy thing to ask for in the sense that Flosso performed on the Ed Sullivan show and often worked at Grossinger's and the Concord and the Catskills. And they inquired and they came back to me and said that, that he was in fact working in the Catskills that weekend and he sent his apologies but was unable to do it. And they were, you know, conning me and in fact had hired him and he came. And so it was uh, great to see Flosso perform for my friends. And they were his... Uh, taken by him as I always had been. It was really nice. It's actually Flasso who performed the frightening ceremony uh, at my grandfather's funeral of breaking the magic wand. They were, uh, they were really close friends and also, I think, Masonic brothers. Broken Wand. Max Katz, 74, of Brooklyn, New York, died March 31st, 1965, following a long illness. Survived by his widow, daughter, two sons, and six grandchildren, including Ricky Potash, magician. I 
I don't often talk about my family, but when my grandfather died, that was the end of my relationship with my family. I was 16 or 17. It's safe to say my parents just didn't get it and didn't get me, and we had no rapport. And I guess it's also safe to say going from no rapport to wanting to get myself the hell out of their house uh, happened pretty quickly, and I left home very early and basically never returned. This week on Don Kirchner's rock concert, The Incredible Kansas, family funk from the Silvers, the outrageousness of the Sex Pistols, some slick dealing from Ricky Jay. Leaving with no money in my pocket and no job was scary on some level, but I ran away to Lake George, which was a big resort area, and wound up uh, behind a bar doing magic and making drinks. And that's what sort of launched my professional career those days out of Lake George. One of my first jobs... Uh, when I was about 17 or 18, I played the Electric Circus in New York, the first psychedelic nightclub in New York City, where I appeared in between Timothy Leary lecturing about acid and the music act of the day, which was Ike and Tina Turner. Occasionally, the Chambers brothers were there as well, but uh, sandwiched in between uh, between Tim Leary and, uh, and Ike and Tina Turner was pretty great. Even though I tried to go to college, and I did go to quite a few of them, uh, mostly to Cornell, I would leave at various times to go out and perform. But I remember performing on The Tonight Show when I was still uh, at Cornell and, and uh, living in Ithaca. I wound up uh, becoming uh, a fairly regular performer on a number of those early talk shows. The reason you're confused is you have a tendency to watch the black cards. Now, you should totally ignore the black cards. It's very important if you're ever going to play this game for money to ignore the black cards and simply concentrate on the red card. Now, I know this may sound hard to you if you're playing the game, but it's fun. So let me show you how this works. Now, here are two black cards, and here's the red card. Let me do this again. Remember, black, red, black. I'll do this once more. Red. Where's the red card? Want me to guess? So, right here. I was doing this for Elizabeth, but it just happened to, yeah, it happened to be right. All right. All right, let me do this once more. Put you know. some money on this one? Well, I don't. Put some money on it. Okay. Well, let me, let me. Put 50 bucks. All right, all right. Ooh. That's all? 50, 50, 50 bucks? Wow. Hey, 51. Okay. That's it. Now you're talking. All right, I'll do this quickly then. I mean, I'm not going to do it as slow as I did before. Remember, here's a red card. Do it as fast here's a as red you card. Want. As fast as I want. Yeah. All right, it's going to be fast. Where is it? This one. Uh, is this what you're. Is, are you looking at this corner? Yep. Yeah, that's what I figured, and that's a good way to get a $50. Some years of drifting around, I moved to California in search of the two greatest sleight of hand artists in the world, Di Vernon and Charlie Miller. 
I found Vernon at the Magic Castle in Los Angeles, where he had taken up residency. He was willing to divulge methods, although not always and not every time. This is part of why it was so exciting to be around him. There were other people who came out, really wonderful magicians coming from different places. Steve Freeman coming from uh, Oklahoma and uh, Earl Nelson from uh, Salt Lake City and John Carney coming from Des Moines and earlier Larry Jennings and David Roth in New York. There were quite a few people. The measure of this man was that he made us literally uproot our lives without any, I, at least for me, without any plan to do so. I, I mean, you know, I, I just... It was extraordinary. He was born in Ottawa, Canada in 1894, and he got into magic at a very young age. The incredibly important event for him in his young life was he got a copy of Artifice Roos and Subterfuge at the card table by S.W. Erdenays. Here was a text on card handling that most people thought was incomprehensible. They thought it was an engineering book. And at a very early age, using tiny cards, because he was... A just a young kid, he mastered uh, this book, which is a, an extraordinary achievement. Later, when he came down to New York in the teens as a young man, he managed to fool people rather profoundly using the techniques from this book, and it really established initially his reputation. And from that, he had entree to the great magicians of his day, and he learned from them. He was uh, avaricious in, in soaking up everything that he could find. Uh, he particularly spent time with people like Nate Leipzig and Max Molini. But also at this point, he was beginning to develop his own material and to really start thinking about sleight of hand in a way that no one before him really had. I'm 84 years of age, and I've been studying magic for 78 years. I wasted the first six years of my life, but... but <laughs> what do you mean you've been studying? Or where do you study it? With other famous no, magicians? No, you, you, you sit in a room, and you take a pack of cards, or you take some dice, or you take a, a handkerchief, and you try to create some kind of a magical effect, and you work it out. Vernon loved to play his acolytes off against each other. He really was uh, like a guru, you know, a Japanese sensei. I mean, he used whatever techniques he thought were possible to get you to do your best stuff. Ricky and I were both the hot kid magicians in New York. I was sort of an apprentice to Vernon, and I ran away from home, was on the road with Vernon when I was 14, and uh, for something like two years, and Vernon could be merciless at, at taunting you with some secret that you were dying to know, and so oh, I'm not going to say you know, One time we were traveling, and he said, uh, well, you know, I've been thinking about magic all my life. I said, yes, Professor, I know that. And, and he said, I think, I, think I, I figured out how to say the essence of pure sleight of hand in, in a single sentence. And, and, I, you know, and, and, and I said, and he said, but I've decided I'm never going to say that sentence out loud. And so, you know, then I'd start working on it. what was the sentence. And, you know, but we'd argue and, and he, you know, said, well, maybe if you do this, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. So, you know. Anyway, and he would never tell you. I mean, so he would get people infuriated and, and fascinated. Vernon and Charlie were different in that way. Charlie was much more direct. Charlie didn't like games in quite the way that Vernon did. Charlie didn't bluff. He just spoke openly and honestly. If you could get him to talk at all, I mean, he was far less likely to open up to people than the professor was. He uh, didn't open up to me right away. It took a while, and uh, so it should. Charlie was born in 1909 in Indianapolis and died 80 years later in Los Angeles. But he probably worked more professionally as, as, a, as a magician than Vernon did in a variety of venues from club dates to cruise ships. 
even though these were the two great old guys of, of magic, there was still a big difference in their age. So Charlie was always the kid to Vernon. Uh, when he was 78, he was still the kid. On the other hand, you know, I, I saw an inscription that Vernon once wrote to Charlie saying, to the finest exponent of pure sleight of hand I've ever seen in my life. So ultimately there was uh, this remarkable respect and admiration, you know, for, for each of them. But uh, particularly as they got older, they could be fairly cantankerous, uh, you know, together. Charlie was inclined to work on the specifics of one particular move and, and, and the finest points and finest subtleties of this particular move. I probably learned from Charlie Miller more about how to refine practice, the concept of instead of just getting into the rote and the rhythm and this wonderful thing of how, of how nice it feels when you hit a move, you know, when you're working on your chops, to actually consciously try to make the move better each time you do it. Being in a room with Charlie and discussing a move is one of the stranger kind of pleasures I've ever had in my life. Charlie would bring up a move and he would start to do it and he would start to question it and he would start looking at it from different angles. He would run to one corner of the room and you'd have to do it and then he'd run to another corner of the room. and I, It was this fine line between torture and absolute pleasure because for Charlie a good evening could be asking you to do the same shuffle 16,000 times, you know, and he'd be very happy doing that and you'd be happy for most of it but he always managed to take you over the edge where you just didn't want to shuffle the cards anymore. I mean, it was just endless, the variations and the craziness of it. And it was, you know, often, you know, as, as close to pure joy as anything that I can imagine. I really miss this enormously in my life. I was incredibly fortunate to actually have mentors with this direct link from people like Molini that went back that far. And the reason that I love Molini is that he performed in the heyday of the most famous magicians, of uh, people like Keller and Thurston and Houdini, but he performed entirely without props. He would literally walk into the houses of the rich and famous, that's where he would perform, and come in empty-handed and borrow a deck of cards, a handkerchief, uh, a couple of coins, a piece of fruit, and somehow uh, create miracles. I'm going to show you a piece from right around the turn of the century, right around 1900. This was a, a piece developed by Max Molini. The idea here was that more than one person would take a card during the course of an effect. So I've had a number of cards selected. Uh, I'm going to shuffle the cards and try to find those cards again. Actually, I have to confess at this point during the show every evening, I wonder what it would be like if I didn't find those cards. <laughs> Just a thought. So, uh, I'm going to find the next card by means of a simple cut. <laughs> That is the Ace of Clubs, the card the woman on the aisle took, your Ace of Clubs. Your card was, you're shaking your head now? No. Ace of Clubs? What was it? Four of Diamonds. If you insist. <laughs> I'm looking for a little sympathy. You give me nothing. Pray to chill for me. I see. Uh, you, you, you took one, uh, I believe. Would you be so kind as, uh, as to mention it for me? Jack of, Jack of Diamonds out of the deck into my hand as if propelled. Uh, oh. uh, 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 Jack of Diamonds. I'm going to try to find yours in the South American or Carioca fashion, if you'd be so kind as to name it. Ace of Hearts. The Ace of Hearts. Let's see. Oh, good. Uh, You haven't forgotten yours, I trust. What was that? Nine of clubs. The nine of clubs, the last card. Yeah, you didn't take one, did you? Were you? Oh, oh, in the second row. What, what was yours, sir? Six of diamonds. Six of diamonds. Now I'll have to find both of them. 
Nine of clubs, nine of clubs, six of diamonds. <laughs> You're nine of clubs, you're six of diamonds. One day I drove up to the Magic Castle when Vernon was sitting on the bench in front of the castle, as he was wont to do. And I said, what are you doing, Professor? And he said, uh, I'm watching people put on their sports jackets. No two people put on their jackets the same way. It was just fascinating. The two of us sat there for a very long time watching people put on coats. It was a wonderful lesson, a wonderful lesson in naturalness and how you begin to understand that much of sleight of hand is the duplication of natural action when you're doing something that may be surreptitious. In terms of legacy, Vernon really leaves a record behind him. And Charlie, in his reluctance to publish or discuss or even share his magic with as large a community, certainly leaves less. But I think he's no less important. I, I think he really is equally important and equally remarkable. Now it occurs to me that people who are really good at sleight of hand will never have seen Charlie or Verna. It's just, it's almost incomprehensible to me. I will not waste your time this evening with kumquats, pears or prunes, no, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, the most prodigious of household fruits, you guessed it, the watermelon. Out of season and dreadfully expensive. Watch as I try to penetrate the juicy, rich red interior of said melon with a perfectly placed shot from an ordinary playing card. Yats! 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 Why is he still doing this? Yats! Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that my last two shots penetrated exactly the same slit in the watermelon, a feat so impressive I am forced to mention it myself. <laughs> You're saying, sure, you're able to throw coins into the rich red interior of said melon, but can you penetrate the even thicker pachydermatous outer melon layer? Yes. Of course not. Who could do that? But encouraged by your approbation, I will attempt to penetrate the even thicker pachydermatous outer melon layer. Watch. Yes. This scares the melon. <laughs> this wounds the melon. <laughs> this ticks me off. <sighs> My last card. Ricky Jay was a student of mine at an Ikeo school in Santa Monica. We had a banquet, all the members of the school. Ricky asked two people to give him $1 bills. And he hauls out his hands and he takes those two $1 bills and he puts them together back to back. And he starts folding them like this. And I don't know how he was folding them, but they just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller until finally his fingers were together. And then he went... <laughs> Like that, and there was a $2 bill there, and the ones were gone. Anyway, and, and after that, it's like, 
that's impossible, you know. And I kept questioning him and questioning him and questioning him. And I waited. And it was probably, I don't know, two, three months later, we had just finished working out. Oddly enough, I was actually in the shower with the water running when a bunch of guys from the class came over and asked me to perform something. I walked up to him and I handed him two $1 bills and I said, do it now. Right? Just like that. And he looked at me, and he put those hand in his hand. He goes, oh, Fred, I wish you wouldn't have done this. He goes, I'm not prepared. And while he's talking to me, he folds the two $1 bills up and does boom and hands me a $2 bill. And I've kept this all these years, but that's the one right there. He handed me that $2 bill, and uh, I was just, I was dumbfounded. He went ahead and got dressed. He acted like I wasn't even there. He did the trick and handed me the $2 bill and just walked off. I first started examining earlier pieces, literally looking for material that wasn't currently being done and thinking, was there some way that I could make a piece that might have been 50 years, 100 years, 300 years, 500 years old? Interesting. And as I began to read the stories of these people, they became more and more intriguing. And then at a certain point, I became a collector of this material. It's always difficult to talk about how you create a piece. And that's something that I really do think about for live performance. The excitement of a live performance is wonderful. But I think that magic at its best is even impossible in that situation. That for it truly to be magic, uh, a magical moment, it, it has to be spontaneous. It has to be something that just happens not in a stage show that's carefully plotted from beginning to end, but rather in a moment. Probably the most famous of those stories is about Molini. That's what made his reputation, doing impromptu pieces. He would sit down in a restaurant at a meal, and he would be at the table for a long time, a number of hours. He never got up during the course of the meal, and eventually he would borrow a woman's hat, and then he would get a coin and he would spin it, and he would say, lady or eagle, he would never say heads or tails. He would spin it and cover it with the hat, and when he lifted the hat, if the woman said lady, it would be the sign that had the woman on it. If someone said eagle, he'd spin the coin again, and when he lifted the hat a second time, there would be the picture of the eagle on the face of the coin. Then he would do this a third time. He would spin the coin, and when he lifted the hat, there was no coin at all, but in fact an enormous block of ice. So it was 1995, and I'd come on an assignment from The Guardian. I'd heard that the BBC was making a film about this very extraordinary Joseph magician, and I came to write an article about him. I came in after the BBC had already started and basically it was very clear the minute I arrived that, that, that it was not going well. And essentially the problem was the director was on a tricky to produce um, a particular effect. He wanted a centrepiece for his film and the more he demanded it, the more Ricky resisted. The tension built and built and built to the point where the BBC and Ricky were really barely talking. In the middle of all of, of all of this, I think as a break, we went out to the Huntingdon Library to try and take the tension out of it. He seemed to be altogether in a much better mood on this day. I mean, we all noticed that. And Ricky said to me, come on, suddenly, he said, come on, let's go and have lunch, which was quite unexpected because he's quite, you know, he can be quite cantankerous, Ricky. I mean, I think he'd admit it himself. He can be quite difficult. And, um, <laughs> So he said, get in the car, Susie. We're, we're going to uh, Sunset Boulevard. We're going to have a lunch together. We'll do the interview. 
I got in the car, it was me and Ricky in the car, I, we started chatting, preparing, you know, the interview that we were going to do, and we took the wrong turning off the uh, freeway, and so then we had to find our way back on, and so a journey that maybe should have taken an hour or something from Pasadena, I'm not sure how long it's supposed to take, uh, took double. And it was fantastically hot on this day. So then we got to the restaurant, and it was the worst possible place for an interview. It was full at lunchtime. It had glass on two sides from floor to ceiling. First, there was a 20-minute wait for the table. And then we sat down at a table. Ricky was opposite me, and he was chatting away, and he started to talk about the tension there'd been with the B BBC and saying, you know, I think that he regretted that this had happened and how he very much wanted to do this set piece that Paul had particularly asked for that had been performed by a 19th century magician, Max Malini, at a dinner party. And he started to tell me the story of Malini at the dinner party, the hat, the dollar, and so on. As he was, as he was telling me this story, I think I became aware at that moment that he had his menu open in front of him. So he was partly concealed behind this rather tall menu. And as he was telling the story, he said, and Malini lifts up the hat. At that moment, he lifted up his menu. And on the table in front of me, I think, I'll never forget it. I mean, on the table in front of me was this huge block of ice. I mean, it was about a foot square. Really, I can't exaggerate. Huge block of ice. That you, later when I picked it up, you know, held with two, two arms. I remember I burst into tears. And I think that shocked him a bit, actually. Because it was such a kind of uh, violent reaction. You know, I just sobbed. And, um, and he said, I mean, he can be very gentle, Ricky, in fact, for all that he growls a lot. And I remember he said, I deceived you, it's what I do for a living in this world. But, um, you know, he also, I mean, it's a moment I'll never have again, you know, I'll, I'll never forget it. I mean, it was a kind of supreme piece of artistry that I witnessed that was done for me. I mean, that's what it felt like at the time. He had produced this extraordinary effect for me. I think I realised in that moment that this was, you know, what we'd all been waiting for, in a sense. I remember looking under the table, you know, there was no water on the floor. The sun was pouring in through these huge windows on two sides. And the ice cube was melting in front of me. I mean, visibly melting so fast that I knew, you know, the ice cube could only have been on the table seconds before I saw it. It was the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen in my life. Charlie Miller, one of my great heroes and mentors, said to me, there's this, this guy you have to see. And I said, sure, anyone, uh, Charlie. And he said, well, he's 15. I said, well, maybe I'll hold off then. I, uh, I thought that that didn't sound very promising. And Charlie said, no, 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 you should meet Michael. So there's a, a, a classic and somewhat mythical um, technique with cards that lots of people talk about, but not so many people do, where the notion is, uh, and you really want to stop moving, um, the notion is really that you can take any card in the middle of the pack, say the eight of hearts and square of the deck, and then without doing anything, have that card on the top of the pack. And uh, the question of, you know, is that is that possible? And to have it look like you didn't do anything is the, is the subject of much discussion. So I was 14 or 15 years old, and I did exactly what I just did there for Charlie. And the next time I saw Charlie, Ricky was there. So that was kind of how we met. What happens in magic that's so interesting is that Charlie introduces me to a 15-year-old boy and we become friends and perhaps on some level Michael's been very interested in the magic that I've done and now I would say we've reached a point where uh, 30 years down the road I'm really interested in learning from Michael and really do learn from him. Right 
incredibly uh, blessed with having somebody that I married seven years ago, and uh, my wife, Chrisanne, who's just remarkable, a great friend, wonderful woman, and uh, a very nice ending to uh, something that I thought would probably never happen. <laughs> Home Shell Silverstein wrote for me. It's called The Game in the Windowless Room. Of all the games I've ever played, of all the hands I've dealt, of all the pots I've ever raked, from matchsticks to nickels to untold wealth, from the beckoning lights of the Vegas Strip to the Pittsburgh Roadhouse gloom, the most dangerous game I played with the man in that locked door windowless room. His eyes were yellow as the golden crown and the king of diamonds head. His teeth were black as the mustached jack. And his mouth was bloody red as the crimson gown on the queen of hearts. And his hand was marked with the sign that's found on the hand of the diamond king. And he smiled as his eyes met mine. And he said, what a shame I've been watching your game as you fleece these witless fools. How would you do it a hand or two? My game, my stakes, my rules. A sealed room, no windows, no phone, an unbroken seal on the cards. No watches or rings or jaggedy things that can clip or chip or mark on a non-metal clear glass tabletop. No mirrors. No overhead lights, with foot-thick walls and just one door that's locked from the outside. For as long as it takes for one man to break, be it an hour or a day, would you dare take a seat when there's no way to cheat? Well, what could I say? So in the silent tomb of that sealed room, we both sat down to play. Well, he was no joker. He was an ace. And although I was the king of his pack, I knew the lady'd have to smile on me if I were to win all his jack. So we played for hours, or was it a week? I lost all track of time. And he won a few, and he bluffed a few, but the final pot was mine. Well, I don't know quite how you did it, he said, as I raked in his last buck. But shaves or seconds or a frigid deck, it had nothing to do with luck. You're a hustler, a sharp, a mechanic, he said. Now the real game's about to start. Here he pulls out his knife and me with just this deck of cards. Ain't it funny to learn how the odds can turn, said he, as he thrusted and flicked and fanned. But I dodged his blade and my eight of spades knocked the knife right out of his hand. Hell, I'll beat you to death with my hands, he laughed, and he raised a powerful fist. But my five of clubs left a bloody stub as it sliced his hand off at the wrist. Yeah, he screamed and he pulled a gun from his boot. Last hand and the dealer dies. But my one last card, my ace of hearts, caught him right between the eyes. Well, that I might say was the game of my life. When the police did finally arrive, they found a windowless room, a corpse on the floor, the door still locked from the outside, and no one there but him and me, a classic locked room mystery. But where is the murder weapon? They search, but they can't find it anywhere. Oh, where can it be? They don't look at me. I'm just playing solitaire. Visit pbs.org slash American Masters. 
or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Deceptive Practice, The Mysteries and Mentors of Ricky J is available for $29.95 plus shipping. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen.